Hello, everybody. My name is David Guzik, and I'm so pleased that you could join me for today, this Thursday afternoon, at least on the West Coast of the United States. It's Thursday afternoon for a time when we can get together and I take whatever questions you have regarding the Bible, the Christian life, whatever it might be. And I certainly can't promise that I can answer all your questions. I'll do the best I can, and we usually have a good time together. We have not met together on a Thursday afternoon for two weeks because we took last week off in observance of the U.S. holiday Thanksgiving. And I had a wonderful time with my family. Uh, it was a great time that we had together, just being together and enjoying all the traditional Thanksgiving foods. I hope uh, that you had opportunity to give thanks to God, even as we have, because we're very grateful for all the great things that God has done for us, especially all that he's given us in the gift of his son, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. So uh, today I begin with a lead question. This is sort of our pattern here for a Thursday afternoon. We begin with a lead question, something kind of of my choosing. And today's question comes from Dan. I think he submitted on social media. He asked this question. What are your thoughts on William Barclay? I'm teaching through Hebrews and I picked up one of his commentaries. Thank you. Well, Dan, thank you for that question. And really, uh, this is a question, I don't know if Dan is asking this specifically because of my own work as a Bible commentator, because in my work as a Bible commentator, I quote many different authors, and William Barclay is one of the guys that I would normally read and quote. Uh, here's an example of the edition of William Barclay's commentaries that I've used in the past. This is his commentary on the letters of John and Jude. I don't have at hand my paperback copy of his Hebrews commentary, as Dan mentioned. Uh, but matter of fact, now I use Barclay in digital format because I have it with a uh, Logos uh, software package. So I just find it more convenient and I can do it on the road and such. But I've had these paperback books for many years and they're still being used. Uh, I enjoy the commentary of William Barclay. And I do quote him somewhat. Let me show you here, for example, here is a screenshot of my commentary on uh, Matthew chapter 1. And you can see there down at the bottom that I quote William Barclay twice. The first quote I use says, Matthew nobly used his literary skill to become the first man to ever to compile an account of the teaching of Jesus, uh, which is kind of an interesting statement for William Barclay to make because I don't know if he's discounting the possibility there that uh, Mark was uh, an earlier gospel than Matthew, or maybe he's just trying to emphasize the point that Matthew's gospel emphasizes more the teaching ministry of Jesus than does the gospel of Mark. But of course, Mark contains the teaching ministry of Jesus. And then there at the bottom, I have another quote, a second quote from William Barclay, uh, we know that he was a tax gatherer and he must therefore must have been a bitterly hated man for the Jews hated the members of their own race who had entered the civil service of their conquerors. Now, again, I just found those comments by William Barclay helpful for myself. And so in my commentary, which really uh, the core of my commentary is just simply my own teaching notes. Those are things that I would want included in my teaching notes. And I cite William Barclay there. OK, so just this point. Uh, obviously, I think there uh, are things to recommend in William Barclay's commentaries. What I have found in Barclay's commentaries is, number one, he tends to make good use of history. Great with historical allusions, rabbinic things, intertestamental things. Drawing on things, uh, you know, in secular history at the time, Greek, Roman, Persian, whatever. Uh, to my experience, Barclay, in his Daily Study Bible series, that's what his series on the New Testament is called, the Daily Study Bible series. In that commentary, I think he makes good use of history. Lots of good, relevant historical references. He also makes good use of Greek. Um, I'm not a Greek scholar myself. Uh, I very much stumble in Greek, so I, I, I rely on the scholarship of others when it comes to Greek. And, William Barclay is a good popular, he's not uh, academic, writing at an academic level, but he brings out many good and valid observations having to do with the original Greek in his commentary. So I appreciate William Barclay's commentary for that. However, 
let me say that there are some significant minuses to William Barclay's commentary. First of all, William Barclay was clearly a man who was influenced by the theological liberalism of his day. And basically, he was anti-supernatural. Basically, he loves to try to explain away the miracles. Let me give you an example. Uh, we look at these great miracles that Jesus did of the feeding of the multitudes. And if you remember on one of those occasions, uh, a little boy brought Jesus his bread and his fish, and Jesus took that from the little boy, and Jesus divided it, multiplied, and fed a multitude. Well, William Barclay said that was not a miracle of actual loaves and fishes being multiplied miraculously in the hands of Jesus Christ, which, by the way, as the text indicates. Rather, he says, that was a miracle of sharing. In other words, in Barclay's perspective, um, everybody had brought plenty of food for themselves, but no one wanted to share and no one wanted to take out and eat their food because then they would feel that they had to share it with each other. So when everybody saw the loving, giving example of this one little boy, it created a miracle of sharing among the multitude. Well, there's just one. That's not what the text says. Not at all. And so I read something like that in William Barclay's company. I want to throw it across the room. It's like, come on, Barclay, you could do better. I appreciate when you make good use of history. I appreciate when you make good use of the original Koine Greek language. But what is it with this anti-supernaturalist bent? So he's clearly a man who was influenced by the anti-supernatural influence of theological liberalism of his day, which in some respect you could say continues on to the present day. Another minus that I find in William Barclay is that his commentaries, and especially when it comes to application, tend to be pretty moralistic. In other words, instead of focusing as much, I, I, I won't, I'm not saying that he has no focus on this, but I don't think he has enough of a focus on it. Instead of focusing on the person and work of Jesus Christ, and all he's done for us. For William Barclay, all too often, the point of the Bible seems to be a great big moral lesson. Now, please, we appreciate that there are moral instructions and commands and lessons for us in the Bible, and we need to hear them. But it's really a matter of emphasis. And I, I find that Barclay tends to emphasize those things too much. Maybe that's just a matter of personal taste. So those are the very real minuses. So in no way would I say to anybody, hey, use these commentaries from William Barclay. Everything in them is great. No, not at all. And I, uh, I would want to be clear that just because I quote William Barclay, as I showed you before right here in my text in Matthew chapter 1, twice, just on the very first page of the Matthew commentary, just because I quote William Barclay, it does not mean that I agree with all of his understandings and interpretations. Not at all. Folks, I, I mean, I, I read hundreds of Bible commentaries from probably hundreds of different authors over the years, at least. That there is no way that I find people that I agree with on every single point. I'm, I'm turning my head right now because I'm looking at a wall full of Bible commentaries. If I could reach across the room and grab the camera, I'd show it to you here. But I'm looking at uh, commentaries by uh, Morrison and Barnhouse and MacArthur and Stedman and Ramsey and Hughes and Van Wyck and Stott and Parker and Morgan and Gabeline and McKnight and... Uh, I could go on and on, Wood and Pink and Kellogg and Meyer. Again, I could go on and on and just start. Morris, Newell, anyway. Look, I, I don't give an unreserved recommendation of almost any of those people. There's something that I would disagree. So I, I feel that I'm able to read William Barclay and appreciate his pluses and not worry about his minuses. Just, well, okay, whatever. That's just Barclay being Barclay, whatever. But I can still appreciate when he brings out a good historical connection. I can still appreciate it when he makes a good observation about a Greek word. So really, that, that's what I would just want to be clear. 
um, I, I really have very little time for somebody who would kind of act or think or judge me on the basis of, well, you shouldn't quote William Barclay because uh, he had a very strong anti-supernaturalist bent. Well, yeah, so what? But there's good stuff in there. Then, and I can sort it out. Now, I, I don't think that Dan was trying to do that in his question. He's just asking me what I think about William Barclay. But I, I just want to make it clear that the, the idea that I could only quote a, an author or a commentator if I agreed with them 100 percent, I regard that as a unbearable burden to put upon any uh, Bible teacher, researcher, whatever you would call it. But this is another aspect of this question that I wanted to just sort of take the excuse to answer here. And that's really to just make it clear that we, we should remind ourselves of what are the good uses of a good Bible commentary. Now, I, I put this list that I'm going to read to you right now here in the description of this video. So you, you can read this list for yourself in the description. But let me just quickly go through what I think some of the uses of a good Bible commentary are. And this is kind of near and dear to my heart, being the author of a Bible commentary that's available absolutely free on the Internet, that many people find helpful as a Bible resource. Okay, so here's some uses of a good Bible commentary. Number one, to confirm what you've already learned from your own study of the Word. Look, ideally, both as everyday Christians and especially as Bible teachers and preachers, we're spending time with the scriptures ourselves before we go to the Bible commentary. We're reading it for ourselves. We're thinking through it ourselves. We're trying to understand it for ourselves. We're trying to interpret it for ourselves. So, yes, I believe in using Bible commentaries, but I don't think that's ideally the place to start. Now, of course, there's always a situation that, you know, you just don't understand a passage at all. Sometimes a Bible study leader or Sunday school teacher or whatever is so pressed for time, they just have to go straight from a commentary and perhaps on a particular week rely on that commentary more than they would like to normally. Okay, well, that's just a passing thing. Ideally, we spend time with the scriptures ourselves and make our observation, our interpretation, our application. And then if we go to Bible resources, such as Bible commentaries, well, it's helpful to say, well, isn't this encouraging? G. Campbell Morgan, to pull a G. Campbell Morgan commentary off my shelf, G. Campbell Morgan saw the same thing I saw in that particular text. That can be something that's very helpful and very encouraging. So to confirm what you've already learned from your study, number two, to correct misunderstandings from your study. Well, look, sometimes you're going to go through a Bible commentary and say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, I completely missed this, and that changes everything. I'm glad I saw that from that Bible comment. So a good Bible comment to help you correct misunderstandings. A, a third thing is to show you things that you may have missed in the passage. Um, look, there's sometimes nobody sees everything, so it's good to get input from different voices, different people, to help us to see there what's in the biblical text. It's also helpful, a Bible comment, to show us connections with other biblical passages that we might have missed. I mean, we believe that the Bible is a unified message. It's a unified book. And so being able to see scriptural connections, a good commentary will help you with that. Uh, another way is to show you things from the historical context that you didn't know. That's one of the things I like about William Barclay. Uh, to also to show us things from the biblical languages that we didn't know, whether it would be Greek or Hebrew or perhaps Aramaic. Uh, next, to show us how the passage has been understood through history. Well, that's very helpful, isn't it? If most Christians have seen the passage a particular way throughout history, I want to know that. And a good Bible commentary will often help with that. Another thing is to give better words to what we've already seen in the passage. I can't tell you how many times I've read a commentary and I see what the commentator sees and we agree on the point, but it's like, wow, does he know how to say it better than I do? So that's helpful to get better words to describe what we've already seen in the passage. We can also talk about that with illustrations. We can talk about that with applications. Again, we see these things, uh, but commentaries can help us express them better. 
Now, I, I do want to give this last reminder before we move on to the questions that come in in our side chat. Please remember, friends, just because someone writes a Bible commentary, it doesn't mean that they're always right and you're wrong in your understanding of a passage. And I'm saying that as a Bible commentator. I'm saying that as somebody who has a fairly well-used Bible commentary available absolutely free on the internet, if, if you read the passage and come to an understanding of it, and then you read what I've written about it, and it's a different understanding, don't automatically think that you're wrong and I'm right. Read the commentary carefully, understand what that commentator's writing, writing, and then see if they can make their case from the Bible text itself. Friends, I think this is so important. I want to know. And if they're showing me something that I didn't understand, something very persuasive from the original language, something very persuasive from historical context that, that changes my understanding, then maybe I'll say, okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're right. I'm wrong. Thank you for that, Mr. Bible Commentary. But I don't lay down too quickly. I say, okay, I have my understanding of it. Bible Commentary, you have your understanding of it. Which has the more substantial biblical evidence? Don't read a Bible commentary and just say, just because somebody put it into a book or has it on the internet, it must be right. We need to be like the Bereans. You remember the Bereans in Acts chapter 17? Acts chapter 17, verse 11, describes the believers in Berea. It says, These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Now, friends, you know what I think is so amazing about that? Is they did this regarding the teaching of the Apostle Paul. And it compliments them on this. It was good for them to do it. So if it's praiseworthy to carefully judge the teaching of the Apostle Paul by what the scriptures say, then it is praiseworthy to carefully judge what William Barclay says in light of the scriptures, what David Guzik says in light of the scriptures. We need to be Bereans and search the scriptures daily to find out if those who we find as generally helpful teachers, uh, whether those things are so, whether they are rightly dividing the word of truth when it comes to biblical understanding. So really, uh, that's hopefully what we come down to in a way that we can understand what's good about Bible commentaries and how we can use them. Dan, thank you so much for your question, and I hope that that's been helpful for you. Let me go to some questions now that have come into the side chat. Um, Kehech, I don't know exactly if I'm saying that right, but uh, Kehech writes, uh, in James 3, chapter 3, verse 13, it says, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. How are works done in the meekness of wisdom? James chapter 3, verse 13. Okay, well, you know what? Listen, um, I think here, Kehach, that your question is good because that's a phrasing that we would probably find to be somewhat awkward. The meekness of wisdom. But I want you to understand, these two qualities, meekness and wisdom, are actually very closely aligned. Meekness, to use a cliche, meekness is not weakness. That, that's not the idea behind it. Meekness isn't the person just kind of, you know, um, cowering in the corner, doesn't want to do anything, doesn't want to raise their hand or speak out. But really, the idea behind weakness in the biblical languages of old really has to do with the idea of strength, but strength under control, which is a very important concept. It's under control. And wisdom is very much connected with the idea of having a spirit of self-control. So uh, when a person is properly wise, they won't be rude. They won't be arrogant. They'll be humble. They'll have self-control. 
they will uh, display in many different ways meekness. And so the meekness of wisdom really just connects these two ideas that are in some way very closely aligned, these biblical ideas of meekness, which uh, the New Testament, even Jesus spoke about several times, but then wisdom, which is a very uh, strongly um, promoted, let's say, idea in the New Testament, repeated again and again and again, especially, I said the New Testament, I mean the Old Testament, especially in the book of Proverbs. So really, that's uh, that, that's how I would express it there. So um, let me go on here to Junebug's question. In Psalm 22, 16 through 18, when David spoke of his hands and feet being pierced and the throwing of dice for his garments, was this strictly prophecy or did these things in some way happen to him as well? Okay, you're quoting that famous passage in Psalm 22 where David does say, uh, verse 16, For dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet, I can count all my bones, they look and stare at me, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But let me just say, we don't exactly know. In many of these messianic psalms, there is a strong parallel between the life and the experience of David the psalmist, or whoever's writing the psalm, let's just focus on David. There's a strong parallel between David the psalmist and prophetically speaking of the Messiah to come. Okay, so we understand that where it actually uh, connects, how much David was just speaking prophetically of an experience that didn't belong to him, how much he was speaking of an experience that belonged to him in some minor way, but actually would belong to Jesus in a significant way, uh, we can't really tell. And so really, that's an important point. I would suggest that normally when we read these Psalms, these are things that David experienced. I like how you phrased this, June Bug, how David experienced it in some way happened to him. Yes, probably in a lesser, in a minor way. Certainly, certainly David was not crucified. But maybe he was in a fight and his hand was pierced. Uh, maybe he was captured and uh, his clothes were taken from him. You, you know, in, in, in a minor way, I would regard these things as fulfilled in the life of David. Uh, but then in an ultimate and prophetically, if you want to say perfect way, fulfilled in Jesus. By the way, I'm going to be quiet just for a moment and see if you can hear my chickens outside. You hear that? That's the chickens right outside my door. I don't know what they're all excited about, but that'll have to wait for another time. Okay, now here, Junebug, so I hope you understand... I, I think that we can't give a final, a certain answer to your question, but my tendency is to think that of these things, these were things that David had experienced in some lesser way, but they still awaited an ultimate fulfillment uh, from Jesus the Messiah. Okay, from uh, Tunnel Banan, there, Banan in uh, Sweden, Subway. Uh, here, where do the souls of the animals go when their bodies die? Human souls go to heaven or hell, but where do animals go? Do all animals go to heaven? Okay, here is a difficult question to answer. Um, and the difficult question to answer is this, is because there are a few verses in Ecclesiastes that talk about uh, the souls of animals ending up, you know, in the same place as the souls of humans. I'm not quoting the verse. I'm just kind of quoting the idea. But there's some verses in Ecclesiastes here. Um, I would not regard those verses as really being what I would call determinative. In other words, as if those verses really settled the issue. Let's remember something. A very important principle given to us in 1 Timothy chapter 1. That light and immortality came to life through Jesus Christ. The Old Testament has a shadowy understanding of the afterlife and the world beyond. 
Now, I'm not saying that the New Testament understanding is crystal clear, but in comparison to the Old Testament understand, it has tremendous clarity. So what I'm just trying to emphasize with this is that I am very careful to not build any understanding of the afterlife or the world beyond on some Old Testament verses alone. I want to see what the New Testament says. And what the New Testament tells us is that there are some depictions in heaven of animals. Uh, Jesus Christ returns on a horse coming from heaven. So there's a horse in heaven. Uh, the cherubim in heaven have a face of a lion, an eagle, and an ox, as well as the face of a man. So we have some kind of representation of animal life in heaven. But to be able to say that all animals go to heaven, the Bible just doesn't say that. We can't be uh, firm or secure in saying that. That's going beyond what the Bible says. Now, oftentimes it's at a moment like this that we give the answer that uh, C.S. Lewis kind of famously gave when somebody asked them, you know, will my dog be in heaven? My dearly beloved pet, my dearly beloved dog, will that dog be in heaven with me? And, and C.S. Lewis said, well, either one of two things is going to happen. Either uh, your dog will be with you in heaven or the glory and the greatness of God and the heaven he provides will be so magnificent that you will have no awareness or care that your dog isn't with you. In other words, it just it seems like it would matter to you now, but in heaven it won't matter to you then and your dog won't be with you. Um, and, and basically he said, if heaven wouldn't be heaven without your dog, then God will provide it. But we can probably surmise that heaven would be just fine without our pets. Even though we love our pets, it's a beautiful thing. We're, we're so appreciative. This is like a gift from God to have a wonderful, uh, loving relationship with a pet. But they're still their pets. They're, they're of a different category. So, Tunul uh, Banan, it's just we can't uh, answer this question from the scriptures. So we have to be careful and not go too far. The most we can say is that there is some representation of animal life in heaven, but it would be going much too far to say that the Bible teaches that all animals go to heaven. Which is kind of curious to me because, uh, you know, people talk about doggy heaven or cats in heaven or whatever. Uh, you know, listen, aren't there some bad dogs? Aren't there some bad cats? And if if there are going to be animals in heaven, shouldn't there be some animals that deserve to not go to heaven, to have eternal separation from God? But that's another matter entirely. That's more of a joke. We'll go on to other things here. Carrie asks a question. Do you think Jesus went to see his mom after he was risen? Well, Carrie, Jesus was present with his gathered disciples on a few occasions, but no specific mention is made of his mother being on that. Now, there is a mention in 1 Corinthians that Jesus at one time after his resurrection, but before his ascension to heaven, that he actually appeared to more than 500 believers at one time. So if you, if you take that into consideration, it would be hard to think that Jesus would not have made a resurrection appearance to his mother, either you know personally in a one-on-one -on -one way or in the context of a broader group of disciples. We would sort of surmise, yes, but again, just as the question I answered before, the scriptures don't tell us. And so we, we can't say for certain. But we have to be able to say, I can speak with confidence where the scriptures speak, where the scriptures don't speak, I can speculate, but I can never put the same confidence in my speculations as I would in my own, uh, in, in the uh, truth of what scripture directly says. So my answer would be probably, but the scriptures don't tell us for certain. Okay, uh, Adonis asks this question. Are the book of life and the Lamb's book of life the same book? Calvinists insist that they must be different because names are erased from the book of life. Adonis, I would say I don't see any compelling reason to say that they're two different books. Um, the book of life, again, uh, 
and then the book of the Lamb's book of life. Again, I, I don't see any compelling reason to say that they're separate books. Uh, as far as being erased from the book, uh, you know, th there are some people that say that uh, in some ancient towns or cities, there was a register of the living. And when somebody died, their name was erased. I, I don't know. Sometimes people say these things and you don't know if it's actually true from history or not. Uh, but no, I, I don't see a compelling reason to say that they are different, um, that there's more than one book of life and that there would be a distinction between the book of life and the Lamb's book of life. I, I just don't see a compelling reason to make that distinction. OK, Horatio asks, could Moses enter the holy place or most holy place? OK, um, Horatio, I'm. I'm kind of going through my mind and I don't believe that there is a specific reference made to Moses going into the most holy place. But I want you to know, I could be mistaken on that. If anybody knows of a passage, it would be found in either Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, probably not Deuteronomy, but conceivably Deuteronomy, where it says that Moses actually went into the most holy place. Uh, I'd be, I'd be very interested in that, but it doesn't come to mind immediately. Now, he could, I believe. You know, it does talk about Moses visiting with the Lord in the tabernacle. That's when his face shone so brightly. But I, I don't think that was the most holy place. That was the holy place. Sorry, here, I'm, I'm looking. Excuse me just for a moment here. So what we have in the days of Moses is we have uh, something called the tabernacle. This is a scale model of the tabernacle that I have not yet built. So I've made this up. And uh, this tent here of the tabernacle was divided into two compartments. The front compartment was called the holy place. The rear compartment was called the most holy place. And it held the Ark of the Covenant behind a thick curtain that was known as the veil. According to normal Jewish law, uh, the law of Moses, one man entered that second compartment once a year, and that was uh, the high priest on the Day of Atonement. Now, Moses was a priest. Uh, he was not the high priest. His brother Aaron was. We, we do believe that Moses went into the holy place, but I can't think of a reference specifically of saying that he went into the most holy place. So uh, even though he may have had the right to, uh, we have no mention of it specifically. Uh, but definitely it speaks of Moses going into the tabernacle uh, to meet with God, at least to my recollection. Look again, this is part of the fun here on a Thursday afternoon. I, I do the best I can and maybe some of it we have to clear up in the comments or in the uh, description afterwards. Uh, but we're just trying to come together to a common understanding of what the Bible says about these things. Thank you for that question there, Horatio. Um, uh, Bob asks, who is the bobblehead behind you? Boy, this is a program where I'm lifting things. I lifted a G. Campbell Morgan uh, book off the shelf. I showed you the box of my model of the tabernacle, which I have yet to build. The bobblehead uh, behind me is a bobblehead of Charles Spurgeon. I have a couple Charles Spurgeon bobbleheads, and here he is holding a Bible and bobbing his head. And um, if anybody has uh, bobbleheads of other biblical, uh, well, biblical figures I'm unaware of, but uh, people from church history, I do have a Martin Luther bobblehead, a Katie, uh, well, her last name wasn't like Von Bora, Katie Von Bora uh, bobblehead, a John Wesley bobblehead, a Billy Graham bobblehead, and a couple other Los Angeles Dodgers bobbleheads. So if anybody wants to send me more, I will display them as long as they're not rank heretics. Uh, they don't have to be perfect, of course, in their doctrine or understanding. Okay, so uh, that's Bob. I hope that that's Charles Spurgeon, a man whom I read and respect a lot. Now, here's another example of a principle that we talked about at the beginning. I don't agree with Charles Spurgeon on every aspect of his theology. In the main, I do. Uh, 
Charles Spurgeon was a very committed Calvinist, very committed to reform doctrine, at least when it comes to what we call soteriology or how a person is saved. In other places, he was not reformed. He was very Baptist. Uh, and so there's a lot I appreciate about Spurgeon and his understanding of that. Uh, but I wouldn't check every box that he does biblically. But I appreciate not only his writing, but the spirit in which he held these doctrines. Um, so again, it's just an illustration of I've gained a lot and I've learned a lot from people that I don't completely agree with. Um, okay, so moving on to the next question from Jennifer, who asks, please clarify for me the difference between a person's soul and spirit. Okay, Jennifer, what, what you're asking about is something that is an area of theological controversy. There are some people who believe that, properly speaking, there is no distinction between the soul and the spirit. They're just two different ways of referring to the same thing, the inner person, the non-material aspect of our being. Okay, those people are called dichotomists. It's di being a prefix meaning two, dichotomists. Then there are people known as trichotomists. Again, these are sort of theological terms. I don't expect you to care much about them. But the trichotomist believes that a human being is made up of at least three distinct aspects. The body, of course, which the dichotomists would agree with, and then the soul and the spirit, and that there is a distinction between the soul and the spirit. Here's where it gets a little tricky, and I'll just be very straightforward with you. There are some passages in the Bible that treat the soul and the spirit as the same thing. But I also believe that there are other passages in the Bible that make some clear distinction between the soul and the spirit. So I would be on the side of the trichotomist, though I think I can understand and appreciate something of the dichotomist perspective. Uh, but I just think that in some places, uh, the Bible uses the term interchangeably, soul and spirit. In other places, it makes a distinction. And here's the distinction as I would describe. Again, we're talking about non-material things. These can be very difficult to describe with precision. So all I can just make an effort at it, okay? The spirit is the part of us that lives or dies unto God. It's the part of us that is inherited from Adam and, if you will, lies dormant or dead until made alive by Jesus Christ. The soul is the uh, encompasses, I would say it could be greater than this, but at least it encompasses the mind the will, the emotions. These are very real, non-material parts of my being that don't necessarily have anything to do with uh, the spiritual world. I mean, they may or may not. And so the soul is something that I think all humanity has, but a spirit that is alive to God that is something only that those who are born again by God's Spirit have. So um, that is the distinction. I, I would mainly express the soul as being the mind, the will, and the emotions, the non-material parts of our being that are common to every human being. Whereas the Spirit is something distinct, something that God makes alive to him, and before a person is born again, is in some sense dead. So th that's the distinction I would make there, Jennifer. I hope that's helpful for you. Uh, Jeanette asks, how long do you think Judgment Day will last? There is a lot of people to judge. Okay, Jennifer, uh, that's a great question. L let me just talk about this. When the Bible talks about the day of God's judgment, or the day of the Lord. It, it doesn't refer to a 24-hour period. It refers to a period of God's work. As if you could say uh, for hundreds, or if you want to say for thousands of years, it's been man's day. Now comes the day of the Lord. 
Now, you could say that it implies some kind of brevity, uh, not being long and drawn out and, uh, you know, extended, you know, uh, you know, beyond measure. You, you could definitely say that, uh, but it doesn't have to refer to a 24 hour period. So how long will Judgment Day be? As long as necessary. Remember, these are things that happen in time and space, but they also happen in the heart and mind of the infinite God who can do many things at once. I suppose it's possible for God to judge the entire world in a nanosecond, even as God can interact with humanity all collectively in a nanosecond. So, um, yeah, we're talking about the distance between the human and the divine, and it's a dis distance that we have to pay attention to and be respectful of. But that's a great question, Jeanette. Thank you for that. Uh, N asks this question. I have always wondered, how does one become a Bible commentator? Do you need a calling like a teacher, pastor, etc., to write a commentary since you're basically teaching, interpreting the Bible? Well, and that's a kind of a funny question because uh, by objective standards, I'm probably not qualified to be a Bible commentator. I don't have a sophisticated theological education. Um, I don't have a seminary education. Uh, I don't uh, have expertise in the biblical languages. My commentaries are not written on an academic level. But as for me, I never sat down and said, hey, I'm going to write a Bible commentary. What I found out through some unusual circumstances was what I prepared for myself as Bible teaching notes was helpful to other people as Bible commentary. So I, I can say very much, even now when I sit down and I'm reworking, like right now I'm trying, if I can ever find the time, I'm, I'm trying to rework uh, my commentary on the book of Numbers because it's pretty old content. And I think if I go through it again, I can do it better. And I'm enjoying that when I have the time to get to it. But I I'm really just writing it as if I was going to teach through the passage in depth. And these are my teaching notes. So how did I get to be a Bible? Because kind of in a series of unusual circumstances, the good people from the Blue Letter Bible put my teaching notes online as Bible commentary. And through that, I found out that what I prepared for myself as teaching notes was helpful to other people as Bible commentary. Now, you could say at this point, I'm qualified, if that means anything. I'm qualified to be a Bible commentary because uh, my work has been out there and at least has some measure of respect and some measure of trust after 25 years. Okay, well, then that's something there, of course. But certainly in the beginning, I didn't have the qualifications. So I guess in some way, uh, being a Bible commentator just being a, means being able to explain the Bible in a way that's true and faithful, accurate, but also in a way that connects with people, that people can understand, that people can learn from. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. There, there, there are, there's not a guild. <laughs> there's not a guild of Bible commentators out there. Um, at least not one that I'm aware of. Hey, if anybody knows of the National Association of Bible Commentators, please let me know because maybe I would apply for membership to them. But as far as I know, there's no guild or trade association that's kind of self-policing. Well, if you pass this test, then you can be qualified to be a Bible commentator. Listen, boy, I, I, I've, shudder to think how nervous I might be in taking such a test. But anyway, I, I'm pleased with the ministry that God has given me to provide these Bible resources to people. Absolutely free. And uh, I just pray that God would continue to use it to help everyday believers, uh, but then also uh, people who have been reading and studying and teaching and preaching the Bible, sometimes for many decades. They also find 
my Bible commentary helpful. So, all right, thank you for that question, N. Jordan asks the question, do you believe people with tattoos have a heart issue and are sinning? And then secondly, do you believe it is sin for women to lead worship or a worship song? Okay, Jordan, let me give you my perspective on these things. Um, no, I don't believe that a tattoo is necessarily evidence of sin and a uh, sinful heart. It, it could be. It could be. Somebody could get a tattoo in defiance to God and any other rightful authority in their life. So certainly, I, I mean, I'm certainly not going to say all tattoos are good. All tattoos can bring honor and glory to God. Not by any means. But also, I know, and maybe you know, a lot of people that they got a tattoo because they thought it looked pretty and they didn't. Now, I, I don't think that this connects with the verse in Leviticus about the command against receiving tattoos or marks for the dead. Because that's really speaking about the imitation of a Canaanite burial mourning practice. In other words, in their burying a person, in mourning the dead, they would get specific tattoos that would be very much associated with those pagan burial practices. So really, that that's in my regard. Th there are people who believe differently, but you're, you're asking me this question, Jordan, so I'm giving you my answer. I, I believe that that prohibition in Leviticus is a prohibition from imitating pagan burial practices and mourning practices, mourning over the dead. So um, as with anything that somebody may have the liberty to do in Jesus Christ, a believer should pray about it. They should seek the Lord about it. They should seek um, if there's rightful authority. For example, if you are a minor, if you're 15 years old and in your parents' home and under their care, you shouldn't get a tattoo without the permission of your parents. I mean, to, to do so would be a flaunting of their authority. So you, you need to make sure it's clear before God and your conscience it's clear before any rightful authority in your life and, and your conscience before them. And uh, other than that, I, I think that it isn't necessarily sin. So it's one of those things that could be sinful for somebody if they do it out of pride or paganism or some other strange practice, but not necessarily. And I, I say that as a person who has no tattoos whatsoever. I, I don't know if that makes me cool or uncool. I don't really care. But yeah, I, I don't have any tattoos at all. And Jordan's second question is, do you believe it is a sin for women to lead worship or a worship song? Jordan, I do not believe so. Now, I do know some people who think that the leading of God's people in worship is a purely pastoral function. And only people who could or should be ordained to ministry should have that role, should have that function. I've read that perspective. I've heard that perspective discussed. I just disagree with it. Um, I, I do believe in male leadership of congregations. I have quite a bit of video up, out on this out there. But I don't um, believe that that prohibits at all a woman leading worship under the guidance and uh, direction of the God-ordained and I think God-honoring male leadership of a church. So, no, I, I don't find that to be a prohibition. And I, full disclosure, in my uh, time as a lead pastor of a church, I have had some women worship leaders and uh, wonderful women worship leaders, I think, who really helped the congregation worship in spirit and in truth. Uh, so I'm very grateful for that. But I, I always rightly, I believe, had the sense that they were perfectly submitted to me and the leadership of the church, that they weren't trying to do their own thing or trying to take over or, or out of order a bit. So, yeah, that's that's how I would answer that question, Jordan. Carrie asks, do you think that heaven knows what goes on down here? Do they get to look in the book of life? Okay, Carrie, I don't know if you mean that to be two questions or one. 
because I don't think the book of life has to do with life down here on this earth, as if we read the book of life and we see what living people are doing down here on earth. Um, I would say that God alone gets to look at, at the book of life. That's the kind of thing that he alone would have authority and dominion over. So I don't believe the book of life is something open for anybody just sort of to thumb through in heaven. Again, I, I don't really have a biblical reason for that. The, the Bible doesn't go into that kind of depth. You know, is is uh, is the book of life something reserved for God's eyes alone? Or does he let an angel look at it? Or does he let, you know, redeem men and women? The Bible just doesn't say anything about that. But all I can say is my speculation that uh, that seems to be something that would be honoring uh, for God alone. Okay, that's the first aspect. But the second thing, really the first question, do you think that heaven knows what goes on down here? Well, God certainly knows what goes down on here. He's part of heaven. Uh, the angels, at least in some regard, know what's going on down here, and they're part of heaven. Maybe redeemed men and women, uh, those who have already passed on to heaven. Maybe they see what's going on down in the earth. Again, we're just not told specifically in the scriptures. Um, you know, there, there are some people who think through it like this. If, um, if you know, your great grandmother is in heaven, and she could see what was going on on earth, it would cause her a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, and we know that those things aren't present in heaven. Therefore, your great grandmother who trusted in Christ, uh, she can't see what's going on. Some people think through it that way. Other people might say. Well, yes, your great-grandmother who trusted in Christ, she can see what's going on, and she is so filled with wisdom and understanding of the great plan of God and all of its dimensions that she sees even the pain and the difficulty that happens on this earth, and it doesn't stress her out in the slightest because of her overwhelming confidence in God. That could be true as well. So what, what we do know is this, Carrie. People are not in heaven looking down what's going on on earth and being stressed or worried or anxious about it. We know that. So whether it's because they can't see it or whether it's because they see it and understand it in the bigger picture of God's plan, we can't exactly say. But we know that people aren't stressed out and worried and anxious in heaven. All right, let's get to our last question for today. And let me say, last question. If you have asked a question that didn't get answered, please don't despair. We save these questions. We look at them from time to time. We'll look to make them our lead question or deal with them at later times. We're sorry that we just don't have the opportunity to get to each and every question every week. Honestly, we're trying to pick out the ones that we think might have a appeal to the broadest possible audience. Uh, but we save the chat and we save the questions so that maybe we can get back to them later. Okay, here, a final question here from John asks, what advice does David have for a young pastor? Well, first of all, if I were to speak to a young pastor, I would say, um, congratulations. Uh, I'm happy for you that you're giving the young years of your life to serving God. That's how it is for my own life and for the life of my dear wife, Ingalil. As I tell people from time to time, give the young years of your life to serving God and you will not regret it. So congratulations. And because you're giving these young years of your life to serving God, you have a a marathon in front of you. You have a long race in front of you. Therefore, don't be in a hurry. I look back on a younger David Guzik as a younger pastor, and I certainly know that there were times when I was, there's the chickens again, there were times when I was just too much in a hurry. I was excited about ministry. I love ministry. I wanted to do so much. I, I should have slowed down, enjoyed it more, enjoyed my family more because the kids grow up and you have a limited amount of time to spend with them. 
Uh, but don't be in as much as hurry. Play the long game. God will give you many years, decades of service to him. So don't be in a hurry and enjoy the work that God is doing in you and with you right now. And just keep taking steady steps in the right direction. You know, small steps, if they're put in the right direction, they add up over time. So we don't need to be in a hurry. We can just keep serving God and serving our families and enjoying the things that God gives us to do and find a great deal of peace and contentment in those things. I, I know that I am very grateful that God called me to ministry and that my wife and I, we answered that call in our young years. And uh, I wish great blessing and happiness to others as they run their race in this. Uh, a few weeks ago, my youngest uh, son, Jonathan, ran a marathon. He ran the L.A. Marathon. And uh, one of the things you got to think about when you run a marathon is don't start out too fast. You'll wear out at the end. You'll enjoy it more if you keep a moderate pace at the beginning. It's the same way in the marathon of ministry. Well, that's it for today. Um, thank you so much for joining us. It's been such a pleasure to have you. Next week, we'll be back here again with another Thursday afternoon live question and answer. And um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your support. Uh, like a lot of ministries here at Enduring Word, we're at the year end. And we just hope that, um, you know, if God puts it on your heart to donate, then please do. If God doesn't put it on your heart, don't do it. Uh, because, again, we, we just want people who out of their generous hearts are stirred to partner with us in this work. But we're very, very grateful for those who do. And uh, thank you for your prayers. And thank you for your just continued participation in what God is doing. It's been a pleasure to be with you today. God bless you, and we'll see you again shortly. God bless you. Bye-bye.